yeah. That, my friends, was Charlie Parker's Dewey Square. <laughs> Welcome to the Licorice Alive section of Rebel Without Applause. Dewey Square uh, was recorded on Dial Records in Los Angeles, I'm pretty sure in L.A., on October 28th, uh, 1947. And this little jazz gem, for me, represented really the dawn of a new age in music, the birth of bebop, the emergence of uh, sort of the, the small combo over the big band of the Benny Goodman era. And on this recording, the original recording, not my recording, which you just heard, Live, that's why I'm still a little bit out of breath, uh, uh, was Charlie Parker on alto sax, Miles Davis, a young Miles Davis on trumpet, Duke Jordan on bass, 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 and, of course, not of course, but one of the great uh, rhythm keepers in jazz history, Max Roach on drums. And this was um, recorded on a small record label called Dial Records, which was... Interestingly enough, the creation of a man named Ross Russell, and he had a record store in Hollywood called Tempo Records. And when he, he first heard Parker, when uh, Parker and his uh, little jazz combo, they arrived from New York and they performed at Billy Berg's nightclub in L.A., which then was on, uh, let's see, was on Vine Street in DeLong Pre. And he came, did Charlie, in 1947 and for this... Um, nightclub date, and Ross Russell, as was all the local uh, jazz people in L.A., were so enthralled and so inspired by what they were hearing that in the case of Ross Russell, he decided he was going to create a record company to record this young genius, and uh, Ross Russell had been a writer. He was, uh, after he recorded Charlie, he was an early, if somewhat inaccurate, uh, Parker biographer, and he wrote a really cool little novel. Uh, well, the, the, the biography he wrote was called Bird Lives, and then he wrote a really good jazz novel, also inspired by uh, the life of Charlie Parker, and that's called The Sound. And if you can find it, uh, buy it. It's a really good little read. And this book, The Sound, was very instrumental in my research when I wrote uh, my screenplay about jazz in L.A. called Central Avenue. Anyway, Dewey Square, that was a tune I just played. Not the most famous bird tune, but uh, I think really cool. It was it hadn't been recorded or hasn't been recorded by, you know, tons of other musicians, but it was recorded by uh, the great piano player Bud Powell and Lou Donaldson. Anyway. There you go. Licorice Alive, Dewey Square. Welcome, folks, to episode number 18 of Rebel Without Applause. Coming to you once again from my movie studio apartment here in the Wood of the Holly, under the famous sign which I can see through my bedroom window. And it is a constant reminder uh, to me of where I am and why I am. Um, anyway, what is up here? In the land of law. Well, we're in a special week. We're sliding towards the end of October, and we are in, by that I mean Los Angeles, in sports heaven. The Dodgers are in the World Series. King James has arrived, so the Lakers might actually be a playoff team, or at least uh, good, or at the very least watchable, even though as of this moment they have yet to win a game at this early junction of the season. And the Rams, uh, three years after returning from 20 years of him, Imposed exile, self-imposed exile. They are back in the magic land of law and are frigging destroying the NFL right now. Goff and Gurley, Donald and Sue. <laughs> Sounds like a law firm. Anyway, they are 7-0 and and look like they have a clear path to the playoffs and beyond. So here is a memo to me. I think it's time. Maybe... For Bill to take your eye off all the political hell drama swirling around us and get focused on what's really important, like the fucking World Series, okay? After all, as of this recording, this moment, we are down 1-0 in the series, and those Red Sox look like they're going to run over the Dodgers like a squirrel on a highway. But we'll see. It ain't over till it's over or till it starts, or till the fat lady sings, which, by the way, I never really thought was fair to that lady, the fat lady, because believe me, 
The girl is trying. She's dieting and exercising, but for some reason she can't lose the weight and she won't sing. And thank God, because if she does, if she does, as the saying goes, the World Series is over. Hmm. Okay. What else? Oh, I saw First Man, uh, the new movie about Neil Armstrong and his voyage to lunar land. And unlike the other seminal movie about the space program, uh, Philip Kaufman's wonderful adaptation of Thomas Wolfe's The Right Stuff, a movie that uh, was consumed with a kind of can-do macho optimism, unlike The Right Stuff, First Man is a film that to me seemed consumed by grief and immersed in the kind of depressive uncertainty, grief for a lost child and uncertainty about the how and the why of getting to the frigging moon. Uh, in tone, the film, I don't know, it kind of reminded me more of Manchester by the Sea than any sort of balls-to-the-wall space adventure. To its credit, though, I thought the film made that supreme American accomplishment seem very much in doubt, and never inevitable, but ultimately for reasons that, I don't know, I'm not really so sure. The whole adventure seemed, I don't know, it just seemed kind of hollow. I didn't, I didn't leave the theater feeling joyous or triumphant. I left the theater feeling at a kind of loss. Why? I, um, I'm not totally sure. Maybe for all its faults, for all its injustices and for all its frailties, the country that sent Neil Armstrong to the moon and back doesn't feel like it exists anymore. And that melancholy, for me at least, suffuses the whole movie. I mean, I liked the movie. I liked, I, I liked it a lot. I was engrossed and never bored. It made me remember, frankly, where I was when Armstrong took that small step and the giant leap that July of 1969. Where was I? I was 13 years old, and I was, a, I was at Sky Lake Summer Camp up in the High Sierras near Yosemite, and I do recall that hundreds of campers, we convened at an old mess hall overlooking beautiful Bass Lake. We sat on a wooden floor and stared silently at a rabbit-eared black-and-white TV as the transcendent event occurred live for all to see. My God, we were all so proud and patriotic, so sure about everything in our world. I mean, admittedly, the Vietnam War was raging and Americans were dying daily by the boatload, but on that summer afternoon... Everything in life seems so goddamn possible. Not so much anymore. Today, we live in a place where the rigorous truth testing of science is, well, it's under assault. Whether it's, I don't know, global warming or vaccines or whatever, these facts are being attacked by the hydra headed monster religion and politics. Feels like bombast triumphs over wisdom and celebrity that truest coin of our realm is valued over everything. A celebrity that is measured in Facebook friends, Twitter zombies, and Instagram followers. Who knows? I don't. Maybe, maybe we're standing at the precipice of a new era. Maybe this is the precise moment of no return. This is the exact point right now of demarcation. You know, like B.C. and A.D., maybe today is just the very last day of the old calendar, and tomorrow is day one of a brand new calendar. Maybe we've finally arrived at that moment when the last 500 years of slow and unsteady social, scientific, and moral progress finally reversed itself. Maybe we've finally arrived at the bright dawn of of a new dark age. Gee, huh. I hope not. Nah, I don't, probably, nah, it can't be, not possible. I mean, let, I mean, our, our country, I mean, we're still the last best hope. We live in, what do they call it, the city on the hill. We still have elections, which one of which is coming up very soon. Please vote. Uh, what else? We still have that 
creaky old constitution where majorities rule and minorities are protected, kind of, if they aren't dark-skinned. Uh, we can still look up to those brilliant, if hypocritical founding fathers. The statues of Lincoln still stand. The Roosevelts and the Kennedys are still in the history books. And God damn it, folks, never forget, we beat the shit out of all those bad guys and all those wars, the British and the Spaniards and Germans, the Japanese, and then the Germans again. And then we put a whipping on those commies in Korea and Vietnam, and we punched Saddam right in the fucking nose. So, yeah, it's going to be okay. And most importantly, we are still possessed of those, what do you call them? Oh, yeah, our better angels. For sure, our better angels won't let us slide back into the abyss. It'll be okay. This is just a speed bump, a little distraction before we're all back on the hunky-dory again. I know it. I feel it. Well, I, I think I know it. I, I think I feel it. Uh, I pray I know it. I pray I feel it. Come on, Bill. Get a hold of yourself. Take a breath. The sun came out this morning. There's still surf at Malibu. The Thai massage parlors are still open. Things will be okay. I think, I hope, I pray. I think first and foremost, you know, we have to remember this as I slide into sarcasm. We have to respect the cultural differences. Embrace tolerance. Different cultures have different strategies for dealing with truth-tellers. So embrace those differences. Vive les différences. That's what makes the world such a wonderful place. So, for example, if you are the fresh prince of Riyadh and a reporter gently and respectfully questions your policy, you chop them up into little bits. If you're uh, a Montana congressman and a reporter asks you a question about health care, you body slam the poor son of a bitch. If you're Putin, you poison. If you're that North Korean klepto killer, your preferred method of persuasion is blasting an anti-aircraft gun at wayward relatives. And if you're the billionaire brat boy or the, by the, the PVP, and that stands for Putin's vice president, if you're the billionaire brat boy and you're a coward, you incite the masses, you instigate, you prevaricate, you insult, you catcall and tease with the full confidence that somewhere, someplace, some other fool will do your bloody work for you. It's like, I don't know, it's like right out of Disney's Aladdin. The brat boy rubs his genie lamp and chants, reporters are the enemy of the people, and then there's a puff of smoke, and there he is, the fresh prince of Riyadh, smiling through the purple vapor. Alibaba, your wish is my command. So you say, so it will be done. <laughs> yeah. And there goes that Washington Post reporter. But either way, the important thing is to remember, and I'm saying this to myself as much as to anybody that might be listening, each culture has its own traditions with dealing with the truths, truths that are, how can I say it diplomatically, inconvenient. Each culture learns to suppress that truth teller in their own unique way. That's why, and you know, I'm a big dude with this, I think it's so fun to study history. So for the Nazis, they invented concentration camps. Well, actually, they adapted the idea from 19th century Americans who created the reservation system for those displaced Native people. Um, that was their way. Uh, who else? Mexican federales, they used to line pesky peasants up against adobe walls and shout, Fuego! Then blast them full of holes. I know this because I, uh, I saw the Wild Bunch. Uh, who else? The Romans, they loved nothing better than a great crucifixion, and their preferred sites were on hilltops and dirt roads for all to see and remember so they could write it all down in Old Testaments. Um, no, 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 correction, I don't mean old. Uh, I mean New Testaments that today we call Bibles, and I know this. How do I know it? I saw Spartacus. And let's see, back in the day, the medieval Euros loved to burn their Jones. They loved to barbecue their ladies of the Ark in the town square, which, 
had the impact of scaring the bejesus out of any other would-be truth sogers. And I'm, I'm reminded, actually, as I talk about that, of a trip I took just a few years ago to Prague. And uh, we toured a medieval castle. And for the benefit of inquisitive tourists, the local historians had restored one of the torture rooms in the basement of a stone tower beneath the cathedral. Oh, my God. I mean, they had racks to stretch people out, wheels with nails on them to roll over naked torsos, metal beds that could be cranked down onto charcoal pits, iron head clamps with tacks all around the inside. I mean, they had in that little room more pain machines than they do at Equinox. I'm I'm frankly surprised they didn't sell memberships. And then, let's see, as we travel down the windy road of history, Who else were they? We had the righteous, of course. Of course, how could I forget? We had the righteous and fun-loving party animals, those Puritans who fled the tyrants of Europe so that they could have the freedom to tyrannize truth-tellers in the New World. Now, the Puritans took special pride in placing their troublemakers, which they called witches, in wooden stocks. And then when the timing was right and the tinder was dry, burn them or hang them or whatever. Hanging was better in the wet season, fire better in the dry season when there was plenty of good kindling to be had. And frankly, believe me, there was nothing worse than trying to burn someone at the stake and the fire won't catch. I hate that. It's just a nightmare. It's like a bad episode of Naked and Afraid. And then... As we move closer to our own time, there were the white-robed night riders of the American South, the venerable Ku Kluxers who loved nothing more than to swoop it on horseback or in later years roar down in their pickup trucks and burn and pillage and then burn some more. I know this because I saw Birth of a Nation. Now, usually the victims were poor black men whose eyes maybe just lingered a second too long on an attractive white woman, or even worse, they had dared to relieve themselves in a for-whites-only bathroom or sit at a segregated lunch counter or maybe, sin of all sins, actually try to vote. And sometimes when the pickings were really slim and there were no black people to be found, the Ku Kluxers they'd terrorize some of those irritating Christ killers. By that I mean a Bernstein or a Schwartz or a Cone or a Levin. And if the pickings were really, really slim, uh, they'd go hassle a papist. And by that I mean a regular old Catholic. Either way, as we look back in time, (laughs) our history looks somewhat like a Hieronymus Bosch painting. Uh, Either way, for each culture... Uh, the adaptations were indubitably unique. And I'm thinking as I, uh, I don't know, as I kick this around in the backwater of my brain, I'm thinking that this might be the stuff for a cool follow-up to Anthony Bourdain's Parts Unknown. Hmm. My wheels are turning. We could call it Body Parts Unknown. Yeah, we could... That's it. We could, sure, we could travel the world exploring how different cultures deal with and dispose of their troublesome tooth-tellers, truth-tellers. I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly not ready to pitch this yet. This is just a thought which is bubbling as I speak. I don't know. Maybe if inspiration strikes, I'll develop it into a concept. And then if I get some seed money and my muse arrives, I can massage that concept into an idea, which at a later date could actually be expanded into an outline or a treatment to wait further exploration as a pilot, which could if the timing was right and the stars align, be extended into something tangible like, I don't know, episodes. <laughs> but I really shouldn't waste my brain space because, truth be told, uh, I need a lit agent, and right now I don't have one, which is really fucking frustrating and really fucking unfair, but, but, but hold that back, Bill. That is another injustice for another podcast. Anyway. My new mantra in these, in this new era, in this bright dawn of a new age is, if you want to preserve free speech, 
speak freely. So I'm trying to do that. And if you dug, hey, (laughs) if you enjoyed this, go to my podcast page on iTunes and write a review. Throw me some stars or better even yet, share it on one of those Instagram pages or on your Facebook. Tell a friend. And if you didn't dig it, please, by all means, keep it to yourself. Don't tell a frigging soul. It's just our little secret for my safety. So, until next time or next week, I wanted to extend my gratitude to you for listening. And goodbye, adios, and...